see yeah that's perfect you should be able to see our presentation if dr curia or any of you can just give us a quick thumbs up or let us know that and then we'll get rolling great wonderful so this talk is going to be on external genital reconstruction and dr skoken and i we will it will be great to have it interactive because we can learn from you as well as dr skoken had said before i'm dr hagedorn i've been at the university of washington in seattle uh, since 2015 and i came to the university because of my specialty training in reconstruction so i did my entire residency and then i came to the university of washington to do specialty training in reconstruction and trauma urology and as well as dr uh, skoken yeah, I've been here since 2019. And before that, I was um, about 3000 miles away on the East Coast for uh, for my residency training and schooling before that. Um, and so each of us did part of our experience at, at geographically different portions of the United States before our last steps here and then um, becoming part of the practice here. And and this is just about our location. So our hospital is called Harborview Medical Center. And our trauma designation is a level one trauma center. So it's the highest, most um, advanced trauma level um, that you can get. And our um, center covers a whole total of 214 uh, centers in the um, United States. Oh, in the in the in the region and you can see here the map of the united states on the right side and we cover we call it the whammy region washington where we are and then wyoming alaska which is in red and then montana and idaho so we we have a lot of states so if you get injured anywhere in those states you get flown or transported to our hospital, where we then um, take care of you. We'll just introduce really briefly, um, Dr. Alex Borchard just stepped in, and you may see him as we speak as well. Hello. Dr. Borchard's a fully trained urologist who is spending an additional year of specialty training with us to learn about uh, some of the disease states that we are speaking about today and other uh, reconstructive procedures. It's nice to meet all of you. It's a privilege to be here with you today. Thank you. So this is from a paper that um, that we wrote a few years, uh, well, one year back now, um, started a few years back, looking at all of the different types of injuries to the genitalia that came to our referral center. So injuries to the scrotum, to the testes, to the penis and the urethra. Um, and we break down the causes of those injuries into penetrating and blunt mechanisms. If it's in, of interest, we're happy to share this paper at the end to tell you a little bit more about our experience and you know, some of the ways that we treat these. But a lot of that we will cover with you in discussion today. And I would be very interested to hear what kind of injuries you see at your different centers. Is it burns? Is it motor vehicle injuries to the genitalia? Is it self-inflicted or gunshots or stab wounds? So I would love to hear that from, from the audience to see what you cover. So these are causes of external genital injury and again, broken down into blunt injury, which includes motor vehicle accidents or sex-related injuries like penile fractures or constriction devices, and then penetrating trauma that includes stab wounds or gunshot wounds, sometimes even dog bites potentially or self-inflicted amputation of the genitalia, either the testicles or the penis. And then we'll also touch on some other ones that are their own category, like infection, like Fournier's gangrene, or lymphedema, swelling, and edema of the testicles um, that can, can be, we call it also elephantiasis that you might see. 
um, then foreign, foreign bodies that can be inserted into the genitalia in different places, burns or thermal injuries, and then iatrogenic injuries, for example, with a penile implantation um, or uh, penile enlargement in uh, surgeries that might have left the genitalia with a, an injury. Um, and we'll, we'll touch base on all of them. We'll, we're going to show a lot of pictures, um, but, but basically they all have in common that you have damage or loss of external genital skin. And then we'll talk about how we go about and reconstruct it. If we pause real quick, I would, like we said, we would love to hear, are any of these things that you see regularly or are any of these things that you don't see so that we can um, focus in some of our discussion on things that will be the most yield for you? We see uh, circumcision injuries, yep. some total um, penile amputations following assaults, and we can speak about that. We'll chime in if, if uh, any of the others are things that would be helpful to dive into in detail, but we'll jump in and if, if anything is not relevant, just let us know. Yeah, and you can keep on adding to the chat. We'll have it open now so we can see if you have any more questions in the chat. So this is scrotal lymphedema that we sometimes see. Um, on the left side, you see a patient who's let, it, let his lymphedema go for a long, long time. And then on the, on the right side, it's starting to become enlarged and edematous. Um, and the treatment for those is surgical, of course. There's no medication or no compression you can do on, on a scrotum that has swollen up in that way. So you excise the entire scrotal skin. Um, and in, during the surgery, what is important, of course, is to find the penis and to find both testicles and the cords. Um, and that is sometimes more difficult than you would expect because of all the edema and all the soft tissues around. It's, it's difficult to find the, the important structures, the penis and the testicles. But once you find them, you basically size the entire skin around. The other disease, this is really common for us here in Seattle and in the Pacific Northwest is uh, necrotizing soft tissue infection or Fournier's gangrene. And this can come up because of any of a bunch of different reasons, skin infections, uh, urethral strictures, abscesses or infections around the anus or rectum. And then sometimes we don't have a clear cause but it is a very aggressive infection where bacteria get into planes that they can rapidly progress through the tissues underneath the skin and um, put the skin and the tissues at risk of dying off. Uh, we know that there's a high rate of death if this is left untreated or if, it's, if there are delays in treatment. Um, and we see dozens of these cases every year the first steps are generally early and aggressive surgery to remove any diseased areas of skin and tissue under the skin and to protect and preserve those areas that are not involved. And then once patients begin to improve, get antibiotics or getting better, then we plan out ways to address this, the skin and soft tissue deficits. And we'll show you some, um, some images of our process of reconstructing these cases. And looks like from the chat, you see Fournier's gangrene as well. Um, and you, in the picture, you can see that there's darkness of the skin of the shaft of the penis, which is already necrosis. And then you see some red, so some, some at least inflammation, maybe early involvement of all the skin above the penis as well. And that's marked out, the boundaries are marked out to closely monitor that. These are some cases um, that we've taken care of who had aggressive surgery to treat Fournier's gangrene. And on the left, you can see this patient was left with a large area of defects where the skin and the tissue underneath had to be removed. All the skin on the penis, a lot, not all, but a lot of the skin over the testes and the scrotum, and then all the skin on the lower abdomen above the penis itself. And 
um, once you get disease under control and the infection cleared, then that next step, like we talked about, what is closure and reconstructing. And we'll speak about this a few times, but our goal is to close everything that can come together without a lot of tension. So you can see up on the abdominal wall, the, the patient's right side, we were able to close. There's kind of a, uh, an oblique suture line up on the, on the belly wall itself. And then the scrotum, we were also able to close. There's enough skin there that we could bring it together underneath this, the penis at midline. But all of the shaft and then the big defect above the shaft, we didn't have skin to bring in, at least at the initial stage for that. So we've applied um, a negative pressure wound therapy device or a wound vac. This is an instrument that applies constant or intermittent suction to the wound, and it promotes um, granulation, ingrowth into the wound. Um, it modifies the bacteria that colonize the wound um, and has several other properties that help with expediting healing. And we try to use this tool a lot for patients, especially like this, that have big gaps or big defects. It would be great to know in the chat whether or not you um, have a wound vac system as well, or what we usually also use is wet to dry dressing. So gauze dressing that's moistened and then a, a dry dressing on top and that needs to be changed at least twice a day um, until healthy granulation tissue can be seen. And when we use wound vax, I'll, I'll just say that we, we don't wanna use it until infection is clear because the disadvantage is that it can stay for a few days so you may not be able to see the wound if you're worried that there still are areas of early infection or that may develop more clear infection. That's where wet to dries are really helpful. And we generally start with wet to dry so we can get a good look at the wound multiple times a day. These patients are usually taken back to the operating room several times to make sure that there's no further spreading of the disease. So this is another disease state. This is a patient who had a thermal injury. This case was from um, freezing temperatures, but we also can see this with burns as well. Sorry, we see Dr. Namuga said gauze dressings are common. We also use uh, sit baths. Perfect and vacs are available in the private setting. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and they can be pretty costly. They are, um, we're fortunate that our insurers do often provide some help for it here in the United States, which I think helps us to use them as well. But I think you're right, it can be a big burden for many patients. So this was from a, a frostbite freeze injury. On the left was when the patient first arrived and we can see swelling, redness, and some darkness of you know early dead tissue on the shaft of the penis and also on the scrotum. In the middle picture and on the right are about seven to 10 days into the patient's stay. And so importantly for uh, many of these injuries, we want, you can't tell at the beginning what tissue is damaged to the point where it will not be viable versus what tissue is damaged but will recover with supportive care. So we don't immediately take these patients to be operated on unless they have signs of infection, worry about something like Fournier's. In this case, the patient did not have any signs of infection, so we watched him closely to see what tissue declared itself as dead and what was healthy. You can see, especially on the scrotum, but also on the shaft, the area that's dead developed an escar that we were able to, um, to remove, and we could see the margins or the edges of healthy tissue that would be left in place. And from the initial picture, you can imagine if we jumped right into surgery when he arrived, we might remove all or most of the scrotum and all of the skin on the shaft. So we may end up being overly aggressive in a case like his. So that principle of close monitoring and delayed intervention with thermal injuries can serve you really well. These are cases to be judicious about your early treatment. 
we ultimately removed those areas of dead tissue. And then I don't have a photo of it here, but we applied grafts to the areas underneath once he developed some good granulation tissue. Once we saw reliably that the bed that the grafts would go onto was healthy and could accommodate them. We'll show you a little bit about that as well. And I know earlier someone said you do not see constriction, constrictive devices. Um, some patients you can see on the left-hand side, there's a constriction ring that's placed around the scrotum and penis, and they're used for sexual um, activity. Um, and sometimes patients have it just around the penis, sometimes penis and scrotum. And the problem is that they, once they st stay on too long, what can happen is swelling of the tissues that are being compressed, like for this patient, the penis and the scrotum. And then the constriction ring cannot be taken off anymore. And the patient then comes into the emergency room and we have to remove the um, metal ring, which is difficult. We have a, usually need to use a saw or a really, really um, strong um, pliers to get the constriction ring off. And then as Dr. Skokan said before, if the patient does not have an infection, you can watch those patients and see what tissues will survive and what, which ones will die. Um, you can see here on the right-hand side, for that patient who had a constriction ring, eventually the tissues of the penis did not survive because of strangulation and decreased blood supply for a long time. Uh, but you don't know how that happened. So you can um, you have to watch those patients also and wait and see uh, which tissues will recover and which will need to be removed. And we see that a comment in the chat from Dr. Namuga that at least occasionally you've seen cases like this. Um, yeah, the, the case on the right is a very advanced one, a patient that presented very delayed uh, after having, um, after being able to remove the ring itself, but it still caused very significant damage to the tissues that prompted him to eventually seek care. That's him after debridement showing the underlying, you know, some skin that was able to be preserved and then the underlying um, graft bed. This is a case of a urethral foreign body, which you might see as well, where patients put all kinds of different foreign bodies into their urethra. Uh, this is a little flagpole where a flag was attached and the patient put that in the um, urethra. Most patients who um, do that might have some psychological um, disease as well. Um, this patient had to be taken to the operating room because the foreign body could not be expressed or milked out of the urethra and it was palpable in the perineum. So we had to make a, a perineal incision. And you can see on the right hand side, you can see the tip of that, of that um, stick of the flagpole coming out of the urethra and we were able to remove it that way. Yeah, it had eroded through most of his urethra actually. And uh, you're looking at the perineum. So our hand up on the top is pulling the scrotum out of view to access the surgical site. I see here in the chat that you just recently published a case report of an eight year old who had a metallic ring around the genitalia most likely. and um, that happened two months ago. So interesting to see that in kids. I actually have not seen it in a in a child before. Yeah, me, me neither. We we saw foreign bodies in children more frequently here, but not um, constrictive rings. Interesting. And so that what all of those disease states that we just talked about have in common is tissue loss and skin loss. And we usually try to close the skin primarily. If it's possible to do that without tension. So on the left side, you see that there was enough scrotal skin left to be closed. And then on the right picture, you already saw that we were able to close the scrotum primarily. And usually we do that in several layers. So not only the skin, otherwise you leave a pocket of um, 
uh, tissue behind the skin, which can accumulate fluid and an abscess can build. So usually what we, we close those um, uh, tissues in layers. So you wanna bring it together in layers where you put dissolvable sutures deep and then you come out um, layer by layer until you then are closing the skin. And you can see that on the right hand side there where the, the lower abdominal skin was also be able to be closed. And when we do close these up, we tend to place surgical drains, so suction drains or something else so that um, as, as measures to prevent fluid accumulating, collapse that space and also put in temporary drains uh, to minimize the fluid that can collect under the skin. So we'll talk a little bit about grafting and then about more complex reconstruction. So what we usually use for the penis and scrotum is skin grafts and they can be harvested with the scalpel, with a knife, but we have a dermatome and I don't have a picture of that for you, but it's a machine that has a, a blade attached to it and you can um, set it to a size of the depth. So we usually wanna use 0 0.012 or 0 0.01 six inches, so very thin graft. So we do not take the hair follicles. It's a thinner graft than that. It's almost like a, it leaves a, a wound that's like a, a road rash. So it's very thin. And then you can either mesh it um, either by yourself with a scalpel or you have it unmeshed. And we decide whether to mesh or not on how much graft we need to use because the meshed graft can be stretched a lot more. Um, and uh, this, the meshing, you will always be able to see those little dots and we'll have some pictures of that. So the unmeshed graft is usually cosmetically better, um, but you need more skin to harvest if you have more area to cover. And um, we did publish on um, meshed um, graft on the penis because uh, usually we do not wanna use mesh graft on the penis to make it uh, look more smooth. Um, but you can also use mesh graft, especially if you have a lot of skin to cover. And then what we put around those grafts is a bolster dressing. And we leave that bolster dressing in place for between three to five days. It depends. Recently, we've been using a, a fibrin glue. You, you have fibrin that we can spray on and then the graft sticks to the underlying tissue. And then usually we can take that dressing off quicker because the um, most important time of the graft to adhere to the bed is the first 72 hours where it establishes its new blood supply. So we want to make sure that the patient doesn't move too much and there's a dressing on, but with that new glue, we usually can um, expedite that a little bit. But if you don't have that glue, I would say usually the dressing should stay on for about four to five days. And I would love to know what you do for skin grafting. So one of the important, um, important features to look for when you're evaluating a wound, um, and forgive me if this is, if you know this well already, but when we're looking at an open wound, um, we really want to make sure that there is signs of healthy tissue um, within the wound in the area that we plan on grafting or in the area that we plan on closing. And we look for granulation tissue, which is, you know, early reactive um, healing tissue formation in order to indicate to us that a, a site is ready for potential grafting. These are some photos. Uh, the, on the left, you can see a uniform pink beefy uh, layer of granulation tissue that runs around the entire penis in an area where the grafts or where the skin had to be removed. And on the right, you can see that on the scrotum. There's a little bit of, you know, some additional tissue that needed debridement on the bottom overlying the testes but most of the cord and the upper half of the testes show a really nice granulation bed that would be ready for grafting otherwise. So steps for us, you know, under completing a treatment of external genital disease. Uh, first is that, as we talked about earlier, you want to identify your core anatomy and define that. So the most important things 
are the deep structures, the penis itself, the erectile bodies and the urethra, and then the testes and their spermatic cords. You need to debride any diseased tissue, either acutely diseased, or in this case, chronically diseased and contracted from scar. So we've cut through skin that has concealed the penis and we've been able to uh, pull the penis into the field uh, where it was completely concealed before. We found the glands, we found the bodies of the penis itself. And you see, as we continue to deepen and lengthen those cuts, we're able to, one more time, we're able to totally expose the penis. In this case, there wasn't a lot of the scrotum that was diseased. So we were able to, to um, complete this procedure without needing to remove much of the scrotal skin. Just a small wedge that we were then able to approximate as we show you on the right there. And then this patient subsequently had a skin graft placed. Forgive the lighting, but there is a graft in place there. It's just a little bit of difference in light between the photos. And then we subsequently placed a bolster to secure that in place and closed up um, any open incision lines. In, this in that patient, we did remove, sorry, let's go back real quick. We removed some of the skin and the soft tissue above the penis. Um, it doesn't look very prominent here, but when the patient stood up, a lot of that prolapsed down and covered or concealed the penis itself. So removing that mons or that escutcheon, which is all that tissue just superficial to the pubis, can help to avoid it continuing to conceal the genitals um, in some patients, especially if they have a lot of redundant soft tissue there. And here you can see that we grafted a penis with skin graft. Um, it is an unmeshed graft, or we call it sheet graft. Um, you can see the tiny little um, openings with, that we make that are really important because of fluid that accumulates blood and also um, uh, sanguinous, zero sanguinous, zero um, fluid that can be behind the graft. So if you have too much fluid accumulated, we'll then detach. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you puncture the graft, even if it's a sheet graft, to make sure this fluid can escape. Um, if you see a blister form in the first few days after grafting, you should open that with a little scalpel, make sure that the fluid can leave um, so that the graft doesn't lift off from its bed. Um, and we secure that on the bottom and around the, the corona. And then usually we place a bolster dressing that you can see on the right-hand side um, that can be placed over the scrotum. It can be placed over the penis. And the inside of that dressing is um, can be gauze that has mineral oil on it or Vaseline, something that doesn't stick. So something that's oily. Um, so you once you take off the dressing, you don't tear off the graft. So you want to have a dressing on that... Um, doesn't stick to the graft and then you wrap a lot of gauze around to form some kind of little bit of compression to make sure that the graft can adhere to the tissues. And what I've seen before around a week or two after, there's some sloughing of the, the top layer of the graft. It almost seems like the graft can is falling off, but it's not, it's, it's almost like it's losing its top layer. Um, and that then, you know, the, the skin cells below regenerate and, and um, form skin. So don't be worried if you see sloughing of the, of the graft top layer at, at about a week or two. Uh -huh. Any questions? Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Um, where there was a buried penis before this, I saw some surgical markings on the mons. I didn't uh, understand that. There's yeah. somewhere you're explaining mons fat and what you do there, there. And you have to let us know if that's a condition you see or not so much. I, I bet not so often, but here in the United States, we see people that are overweight, that have a lot of fat, of tissue around their genitalia. And what can happen is that the penis, because of urine leaking over the skin a lot, it can then scar and the penis cannot come out anymore. And so what 
Dr. Skokin and I help do is expose the penis that you see here. And then our plastic surgeons remove the outlined portion of the skin. They remove the entire skin and fat below. And you can see on one other here, you can see the suture line. So they had removed the entire skin and that's important to keep the penis out. Uh, but it's um, a condition that you can see with um, obesity or overweight patients. Yeah, most often obesity, we sometimes see it from lymphedema and a couple other disease states. Um, but the average patient that we do a surgery like this, a buried penis repair on, has a body mass index of 40 or 42, which is a, um, uh, it's a weight of maybe 300 pounds or more. So it's rare that you see this except in patients that are at least overweight, if not significantly obese. Yep, I, I get it now. We see in children, yeah, like what Job has seen, we see it in uh, teenagers, their parents are so worried the penis can't be seen. And um, our children's, we have a, a pediatric urologist, so dedicated children's trained urologists, and we have five now, five in our group that work at our children's center. And they do do treatments that are similar, we think there are a couple ways in which the disease state is a little different. In those cases, it may be that there is less fixation of that superficial tissue to the bones underneath than in some patients who have, you know, in, in somebody who doesn't have a concealed or buried penis in childhood. And in adults, we find that this is much more because of growth of that redundant soft tissue or scarring that entraps the penis itself. Great question. This is a skin graft that is post-op day five on the left and post-op day 14. And this is a sheet graft. You can see that cosmetically, it looks very good um, because it's, it's you know, smooth uh, skin without any dimples. This is a meshed penis graft um, that you can see here, you can still see the dots. And they become less prominent over time, but usually patients can notice them a long time. So why do we choose one or the other? It's usually that, you know, some, some of our surgeons prefer to use mesh grafts, even on the penis, but usually we would choose this because maybe the patient has burns elsewhere and needs a lot of skin graft. And then if we accept a mesh graft just at that, at that site and other sites, it may mean that they need less skin taken from healthy sites. So that's the big reason is if there's a large area or multiple areas that need to be covered, we may take a mesh graft just to avoid extra, um, extra recovery or morbidity for the patient. And this is another example of meshed graft to the scrotum or to the testicles and to the penile skin. You can see those two patients are patients who suffered from Fournier's gangrene. So they have a lot of tissue excision and you can see the combination of primary closure, especially on the right side. This is a very obese patient, um, but you can see primary closure was used for the buttock area and the um, upper uh, mons uh, slash groin area and then the, the testicles were grafted. And usually that won't happen until the patient has recovered from the infection, they are uh, getting better, the granulation tissue has formed, which I think in my experience takes at least five to seven days, sometimes even longer. Um, and the, the, the testicles are brought together in the midline. It's important to, to sew them together, otherwise they are not gonna stay as a unit. So you sew them together in the midline and then you place the, the graft around. Sometimes for these patients, if they've lost the skin on the scrotum, we will actually create a different space for the testicles. Um, and that can be safely done in the thighs. We actually, I think we have a picture of it in one of the priors. Let's go. Let's go. So, uh, we call this thigh pouches. Here, 
So this patient had thigh pouches created and we develop, we bluntly develop a space that goes from your open wound to just above the fascia lata in the medial thigh. So immediately adjacent there where Dr. Hagedarn is showing and on the other side is where the testes sit. And there are some benefits to that and some drawbacks. The benefit is that if the patient otherwise would not need skin grafting, then it may avoid them needing to have a graft taken entirely. The rest of the wound might be closed with just stitching. Um, so it may be a simpler course of recovery for some patients. Um, we know that the, the, the testes might sit in a warmer environment there. So it might impact a little bit on their function, um, maybe on making sperm possibly, but maybe less likely than making testosterone. Um, the other thing is it can be really difficult to remove the testes from those pouches. It is possible to reverse it, but we usually think of it as a permanent solution for the patients that elect for it. And we, we uh, usually propose it as such when we talk with patients about it, but we offer both options to patients and maybe, I don't know, half or half and half, maybe some patients choose that for simplicity and some have us do crafting and recreate a scrotum. I think what we usually try to offer it in older patients who might not need the sperm function. Yeah, absolutely. Or patients who need blood thinning medicines, it can be a good tool there as well. Absolutely. So this is a, a meshed scrotal graft a year out. This patient had another penile surgery, so it's unrelated, the catheter and the dressing on the penis are unrelated. Um, but this is a good, very nice uh, scrotal graft. You can see it's it's pendulous and it and the testicles are together in a unit, uh, making um, a new scrotum. And over time, the skin gets a little bit of mobility or laxity relative to the the stuff underneath it. So we find that it gets a little bit of that motion back. Same thing on the penis as you get further out in their recovery. Now we'll go over some more complex injuries. This was a gunshot wound to the penis. So this is a patient who had a gunshot wound. Um, I think if I remember from a, a gun in his pocket and the only site that it injured actually was the penis itself. Um, so that involved his glands. It actually spared the deep structures, but important principles for this are um, exploration, and wash out, thorough wash out of the wound, and an investigation of the important or the critical structures in the penis. So in this case, we needed to uh, determine is the urethra involved or affected by the injury? And are the deep erectile bodies involved? Um, and then is the, you know, among the dorsal neurovascular bundle, is there injury to the major arteries? So we did explore this wound. We found that the erectile body was completely intact. The wound only involved some of the spongy tissue of the glands and the skin and dartos. Uh, the way we, de we determined that was to expose the erectile body and then create an erection. So put a needle into it further down on the penis and inject in a uh, sterile saline to create an erection in the operating room and make sure that there wasn't a leak in the area of the injury. Then we removed the non-viable tissue. And as you see on the right, we were able to close up the skin and all the tissues underneath it in layers. Um, and he do, did lose a little bit of the spongy tissue of the glands. There's nothing that you can do about that in the acute period, but we'll show you at least in advanced cases, some tools that you can use to recreate the glands. And he ultimately healed up and fortunately had a good outcome. His urethra was not involved as well. And we have two questions not related to this case, but to the previous topics we discussed in the chat. I think it might be nice to stop real quick and um, yeah. you know address them. So one question is when do you bury the testis on in the into the thigh? And when do you put them back uh, to a scrotum? And you know, the, it needs you need to be able to put them in the thigh. So the patient needs to be able to have thigh tissue, of course. Um, sometimes fornis gangrene involves the thigh, and if there's no skin, you won't be able to do thigh pouches. I personally reserve it more for patients who are older, 
or patients that um, do not worry about the cosmetic outcome of not having a scrotum. Uh, so can it be offered to anybody? Yes. Uh, but for example, if it's a young patient that had scrotal skin loss there in their 20s, for example, then burying the, pen uh, the, the testicles away, um, we know that they will lose um, function um, and spermatogenesis will go down because of how warm the testicles are in that place. So that's not a good option for, for young patients. So I think age makes a difference for me. Or some patients, they have so much pain with dressing changes and want to not go through the whole grafting process. So it's sometimes it's patient driven where they say, I want the simplest option that gets me out of the hospital as quickly as possible. And then the thigh pouches are a great option because you do not need to do the bolster dressing and the grafting. And usually you can close the perineum primarily. So you tuck the testicles away and then close the perineum. And the last case where we may use it is patients where you're really worried about their capacity for healing and their, you know, their microvasculature. So maybe they're a really advanced smoker. Maybe they're on high, they have a long-term need for a lot of steroids where you don't know whether, how, how reliable that bed of granulation tissue may be. You know, if you form some real granulation tissue, you probably can lay a graft on it, but there certainly are some cases where we worry a little bit more and we may, um, consider doing thigh pouches for those patients a little bit more strongly. And the yeah. second question we have is, um, when you apply the vac, a wound vac, to a defect in fourniers, are you waiting for good granulation to apply a graft, or do you want it to epithelialize by secondary intent? And we've used it for both purposes. Um, most of the time, we use it temporarily for maybe a week or maybe two weeks, uh, looking for granulation tissue with a goal that we will graft. The case where we most often use it to totally epithelialize um, is maybe if there is a big defect or a big uh, step off. So maybe the patient's skin around the area that's been debrided is six inches or more higher than the wound itself because of a lot of soft tissue, obesity, things like that. And if we were to just graft that, they may have a big divot or a big step off where it's their skin, then you drop down into a valley of grafted skin and go back up to the skin around it. So that patient might be better served with having, you know, four or six weeks with a wound vac that lets them heal all the way from deep down up to near the level of the skin, and then either epithelialize that or have us put a graft on at a much later date. Great questions. This is another patient who had a surgery in the past to put in a, a penile, uh, no, sorry, he had a surgery for priapism in the past. Um, so he had an erection that lasted too long and caused damage to the, his corporal bodies. And he had a few treatments elsewhere, ultimately had um, a, a complication where part of the glands was compromised and died off. So you see on the left that maybe between a third and half of the glands of the penis actually has been lost. And you can see kind of a loss of domain or a transition point between the intact healthy glands to over on the left side, this almost dog bite defect. And he did not have erections and wanted to work towards getting a penile prosthesis in place. But we worried because he wouldn't have coverage of that site. And so in, in, we can talk much more about this case, but in short, we sought to create, recreate part of the glands and we did that. You can see on the right, we actually have a, a patch filling in that defect and creating a conical or cone-shaped glands again. And that was taken from the radial forearm. So we took a small strip from the arm, brought it with its own blood vessels as a free flap, connected it to some of the femoral blood vessels, and then reconfigured it to actually create that missing portion of cap. And he ultimately healed that up and is almost to getting his prosthesis in now, but is, uh, he, he's doing really well with that. So even in very, very complex injuries, we often can have the tools 
to recreate or get close to original anatomy just requires some creativity and, and oftentimes partnering, like in this case, partnering with our plastic surgery colleagues to use their expertise and tools to um, deliver on this patient's needs. And I don't have any pictures, but what we can also use for perineal, big perineal wounds, uh, scrotal wounds would be a gracilis flap. So a, a, the thigh uh, muscle, the inner thigh um, that can be used on its own. And then you can graft with skin graft on top of that muscle. You can also um, bring a skin island with it that's attached to the gracilis muscle and, and have the skin there. Um, I've used that before in patients who've had penile cancer or urethral cancer where the entire genitalia need to be removed. Um, and then there you'll be lost, left with a large defect. And that defect is then filled with using a myocutaneous, so muscle and skin flap from the, that's based on the gracilis muscle. And that's also done with our plastic surgeons. Ashley, we have just until um, 11 o'clock or, or 1 p.m. for you, is that right? Yes. Okay. So we may we may go a little more quickly through one portion so that we can really get into some of the penile reimplantation. We'll skip over this, but this is just showing you a little bit of some other acquired um, defects that patients can develop. This patient had implants to the penis from uh, from another provider. And we can probably go quickly through that because as urologists, you're very familiar with testicular uh, injury. And I don't know how much of a ultrasound imaging capabilities you have, um, but I think that any penetrating injury to the genitals needs to be explored. There does not need to be any imaging for that. Any patient needs to be um, examined under anesthesia in the operating room for a genital penetrating injury. In blunt injury, almost the same. You know, if there's a lot of hematoma, I think it's okay to use, give, uh, take the patient to the operating room. This is an ultrasound of a blunt injury that you can see the tunica albuginea of the testicles disrupted. Um, this is what we found is, is basically the tubules come out and you try to repair it and, and preserve the viable tubules. Sometimes you can put a tunica vaginalis flap on if there's not enough uh, tunica albuginea left. Um, here, another uh, picture of a scrotal expiration after penetrating trauma from a gunshot. Um, you can see, the, I like the picture on the bottom, you can see the healthy testicle and then the, the one that's non-viable anymore. It's necrosed um, and there's tubules coming out and sometimes that leads to an orchiectomy or removal of the testicle. And this is a penile fracture. And let us know if, if you do see these with some frequency or it'd be helpful for us to spend more time on this, but it's a blunt injury, usually during sexual intercourse, but it can happen for a few other reasons, including from falls and things like that. Patients usually experience a pop or a breaking sensation and immediately lose their erection and then can have some pretty significant swelling afterwards. Um, usually it comes up pretty quickly. They can have injuries to the urethra in a significant number of the cases, and especially if both uh, erectile bodies are injured, the rate of urethral injury is uh, maybe about 40%. Um, so it's always important to really strongly consider investigating the urethra, either by getting x-rays or maybe by passing a scope into the urethra or getting a good exam of it when you do a surgical exploration. If you have any level of worry about a penile fracture, um, then you re really should strongly consider or go directly to an operative exploration for these patients. Um, on the bottom, you see one approach making an incision on the undersurface of the penis, um, which we use often and can get you exposure even all the way up to the dorsum of the penis pretty well. You might have to get wide exposure, but you can get everything you need. And usually these are injuries on the undersurface. So an incision like that gets you great exposure in most cases of what you need to see, including the urethra. And I see that you have experience with uh, penile fractures. Um, I think this year in your center, you had three uh, injuries. That's pretty good. Yeah, and, and these are 
two different cases where you can see the approach is different. Sometimes when you can feel the defect and you know where it is, you can do that ventral incision and uh, spare the patient a circumferential incision. But on the right side, you see there's a circumferential degloving of the entire shaft. And that patient actually had bilateral corporal injuries. You can see them on the on the bottom here. You can see one and then you could, could actually follow that through to the other corpora, which was also ruptured so that exposure circumferentially might be necessary in some patients. And then the self-amputation, I know that we talked um, previously that you've seen those as well. So you have uh, uh, experience with that. Again, there was a psychotic uh, break due to drug ingestion on a patient who then um, amputated the penis on their own. And usually, you know, you want to make sure that the phallus is on a little gauze on, on ice or cool down and uh, it'd be brought to the hospital and you explore both sides um, of it. And the, the, the connections that urologists do, we do is the urethra and the, and the corporal bodies. And I usually start with a corpora because it, it's um, easier to sew together. And then I flip the, pa the penis up to do the urethral more delicate um, uh, anastomosis uh, after that. But here you can see the urethra was connected first and then following the corpora. And then we give the case over to our plastic surgeons that do the microvascular repair. But if you do not have that, you can stop with a, ma uh, with a macroscopic repair. Uh, usually the skin will die uh, because there's no venous um, uh, uh, drainage and also no blood supply to that skin. So the skin will die. You can even take it off at the time when you only do a macro uh, vascular repair or ma a macroscopic uh, repair. Um, and then you can graft the penis later on. And here's showing you when we do a microscopic repair, um, our plastic surgeons help out in reconnecting the dorsal neurovascular bundle. So usually that is the dorsal arteries, or at least one dorsal artery, the deep dorsal nerve, and then, uh, sorry, the deep dorsal vein, and then the dorsal nerves, or at least one dorsal nerve, one side or the other. And that helps, as we talked about, with um, preservation of skin. It helps to limit the risk of developing a stricture afterwards, and it also helps with the recovery of sensation. And this is a reattached penis. We, I think that was just a few months ago. Um, that patient actually had lost after a few days, the skin of the distal shaft got necrotic and completely sloughed off. Um, but the integrity of the corpora was there and the urethra was preserved. So we proceeded with grafting. We can skip over that. Uh, it's just about the mass microvascular repair that Dr. Skokin was talking about. Uh, we have had patients that come in without the penis uh, the distal end, it's it's lost or they threw it away or um, the, so in this patient, we were able to use the scrotum. We just pulled the scrotum over and um, the patient's peeing now out of that scrotal, um, uh, basically you use the scrotal skin to cover the penis and then um, the urethra was spatulated and brought out in the scrotum uh, to make sure that the patient can urinate through that. And so similar to what we were speaking about before, that's using some of the tissues you have available, the healthy things adjacent to where your disease is to um, close or repair your defects. And a scrotal skin flap, if the skin is healthy, can be a really versatile tool. That's everything we've got prepped. We're very happy to hang on here um, and speak more or answer any questions. We'd love to hear more about some of the experiences that you all have. Um, and uh, if we can share anything afterwards too, please just let us know. I know it's late. Yeah, we really appreciate you spending the time with us and having us to speak with you today. Yeah. Dr. Kigongo, when you had those uh, penile fractures. Did you deglove the entire pe penis or did you make a ventral incision? Um, the two I attended, we, we, we used the circumscribing incision, degloved. One of the patients actually 
was not circumcised, but we consented him for a circumcision in advance because the hematoma was was dorsal. So we 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 degloved the whole penis and so mm -hmm. um yeah but I've seen the, the nice ventral incision it, I think it is it is cosmetic then and you said you can access the dorsal through it. Yeah so I don't have photos of this that's my preferred incision for anything. Um and so I uh will use that also for corporal ruptures after injection therapies, which um, is something that we see for Peyronie's disease, a curvature here. Um, and you can actually, you need to extend your incision up a little ways towards the corona. But if you put a Penrose or a surgical drain on tension underneath the penis, between the penis itself and the skin, you can tension it so that you can actually rotate it and see that any part of the penis um, and, and work on any part of the penis without much difficulty. Dr. Namuga had a question about female genital injuries. And Dr. Namuga, I'm, I'm glad you're asking. We're just looking at our, all our female genital injury um, injuries here at, at Harborview, and um, they are re really rare. Um, they involve the gynecologists if the vagina or uh, uterus are involved, but um, usually if it's external genitalia, a laceration or a urethral injury, bladder neck injury we see from pelvic fractures, um, we get involved um, in them. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the lacerations, I actually never had to graft a female external genitalia. I've only been able to close them primarily. Um, uh, but for this gangrene, that usually goes to our gynecologist for female gy uh, for this gangrene. So grafting can be possible in the in the external genitalia in women. Um, but usually the urethral injuries we get involved in, and and we found that the primary repair at the time of injury is best. Um, and that's different from male urethral injuries that we usually wait uh, at least you know two to three months before we then repair the urethra after its strictures, but in women, it has been shown to, it's, it's better to um, repair the urethral injury at the time of the um, uh, acute trauma. Um, also to uh, prevent any urine leakage and any fistula to the uh, vagina. So usually those are repaired together, the vaginal injury and the urethral injury. We've had bladder neck injuries. Any other questions? Great question. I, yes, I have a question. I, uh, do you routinely have to remove excess granulation before a graft? Or you do not bother? That's a really good question. I, I mean, we've moved more towards keeping it as long as you have a uniform bed. Um, one of our colleagues used to do a lot of removal. Of, I think Dr. Wolski did that, mm -hmm. removing the granulation tissue, using it just as an indicator of healthy bed, but not necessarily a good bed itself. So used to cut it out and then lay, um, lay the graft onto the underlying tissue. We've moved to laying it onto the granulation tissue as long as it's pretty uniform. If you have big ridges and valleys, you probably should debride that to get a more flat bed or more contoured bed for your graft to lay on because you don't want it to be up on a peak here and then have a deep narrow valley and then up on a peak next to it. It won't take well in that case, but we've had good results with uh, preserving much of the granulation tissue um, and that's healthy. It's got a lot of new vasculature to it. Um, it's got a lot of inflammatory ingrowth. So there are reasons why that might even serve well um, or even better as, it, as the bed itself. Mm -hmm. And we definitely, before you graft, you saw those, the healthy granulation tissue we showed you, we you always use a little correct or a little scraper. You can use the back of a knife um, blade handle to scrape off some of that um, granulation tissue to make it bleed because that's what's needed. It's the exposed blood vessels for the graft to then uh, take and, and take its nutrients from. So it's important to not just graft onto that pink tissue, but you scrape it off and make it bleed all around um, and then put the graft on. A couple uh, additional questions in the chat. Do you do primary closure for gunshot injuries? 
Um, and it depends if you're worried about um, blast effect, maybe it's a rifle injury or something like that. We tend to avoid um, initial closures because you want to see, or early closures, because you want to see if additional tissue has been damaged that you just can't tell by the eye yet. Um, in general, most of the uh, gunshot injuries we see are handguns. And there we try to do primary repairs. So if the erectile body is injured, we try to sew it up directly. We had one patient who had a gunshot and it only involved his urethra. And we did a primary repair of his urethra at the time. Um, and so if it's a lower energy, which is the majority of what we see here, we do, do try to do primary closure as long as the tissues um, don't show gross signs of infection or things, you know, visible evidence that much more is involved than what we can, um, you know, than, than the actual track. Dr. Servada was asking if we do full thickness or split thickness graft. Uh, most of the time split thickness, if there is enough um, bulk um, of tissue that we are grafting. Um, you could do full thickness grafts around the penis or, um, but usually it's split thickness graft. They take very well. And mobility, initially the skin is pretty fixed, but over time, over several months, it uh, develops some mobility relative to the structures you graft it to. And so we've always been really impressed to see that over time, it gets more mobile. And Dr. Kagongo shared, used to think that uh, flaps are more cosmetic than grafts for the scrotum. Um, you see that we don't use flap reconstruction for the scrotum. Um, like the pudendal flat thigh flap. Yeah, and um, some places do use that, but I think more and more in the United States, we use grafting. Um, one of the hurdles with the flaps, with rotation flaps is that they can add significant bulk. Um, and we found that we can get bulk more in line with the native or original scrotum with grafting in the long term. And so we've been really happy with that result. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is that because of the volume of patients we see here, many times for grafting on the scrotum or penis, we can do that ourselves. We um, don't have experience ourselves with some of the thigh-based or perineal-based flaps or more advanced flaps. And so that may require coordinating with our plastic surgeons um, who also are really busy taking care of other disease states. There's a question about Peyronie's disease, which we didn't talk about. And I think the question was excise the scar or placate. Um, not sure if we want to, you know, I'm happy to talk about that some Peyronie's disease um, is not necessarily an injury or trauma, but um, the curvature of the penis. And, um, you know, the plication works very well. Um, I think if there is a big plaque, of calcified, calcified tissue, then we tend to excise it and then graft over the excised tissue. Um, and the plication is kind of reserved for um, patients that don't have a lot of plaque. And then the, the curvature, I've had success with even, you know, almost 90 degrees curvature with plication. Of course, you shorten the penis a lot. And that's another um, consideration here. Do you want to excise the plaque and graft and keep the pina length? Or do you want to plicate? And if the penis is quite curved, then if you plicate, you shorten the um, penis quite a bit. So that will need to be discussed with a, with a patient. Yeah. It's probably only maybe three to 5% of um, Peyronie's surgical patients that ultimately get a plaque incision. So the vast majority either get a plication or if they have severe erectile dysfunction, they may get a penile implant to treat their disease. And um, Dr. Servada had a question about any tips on microvascular surgery doing reattachment of the amputated penis. Um, so one caveat is that the urologists here are, are doing a macro um, scopic repair so the urethra and the corpora and then the our plastic surgeons come in and do the microvascular repair under a big microscope and they use tenno suture and what they found though is that the more vessels that you anastomose 
the less successful. Um, so that's kind of interesting. So you really need one artery, one vein for drainage, and then the nerve for sensation. And um, you can do that at some places. This is done with a uh, microsurgery trained urologist to help as well. So like an infertility uh, physician is our best correlate here. Um, it's just that our we have a great relationship with our plastic surgeons who do microvascular work on a regular basis. So we found, sorry, we're going to have an overhead page. Give us a moment. Um, we have a question uh, in penile amputation. Is there cutoff time beyond which it is futile to try to reimplant the penis? If you're not able to do a microvascular surgery, should you hold off on the surgery entirely? Good questions. Mm -hmm. I think that if you have the phallus, if you have the penis, and you do not have the microvascular it's capabilities. Nine, sorry. Sorry about that. So the if you have the phallus, I think it's still worthwhile attaching, especially because the spongy tissue of the corpora usually gets a lot of blood supply. So I think mat, macro um, surgical attachment um, is still possible. The, the worst thing that could happen is it just doesn't survive and it falls off again. Um, but I think giving it a chance. So I would go even um, hours out. Um, there is definitely a cutoff, I think, between six to eight hours is ideal. Anything after that is more difficult to preserve, to, to um, preserve. But then even if you could, could um, have one penis taken, threes don't, three don't at, at the hours of 10 hours, 12 hours, then I think attaching the penis is still um, a good idea. And um, if it's preserved on ice or cold ischemia, then you can get to 12 hours or maybe even a little longer and still have a reasonable chance of successful take. The one other caveat I would give is if you're caring for a patient who's going to have very limited access to resources um, uh, and they present in a very delayed manner, that certainly could be a case where you consider not replanting. Um, if they're not going to be able to come back to the office um, or not be able to uh, stay in the hospital to get wound care, then, um, you know, uh, if they have a lower likelihood of replant, that might be the case where you decide to hold off. But in a patient who either can stay in the hospital or can get back to you, even if they're beyond the window, um, unless the, uh, the stump looks grossly non-viable, we will try to reattach. It's their one opportunity. Great discussion. How do you handle deep burns? Good question too. I think any burn, the initial um, treatment should be wound care. Um, you know, we have a burn center here. So we have the burn staff and nursing do a lot of dressings. And um, I think that like Dr. Skoken was saying during our discussion that you need to wait to see what survives. Um, so even deep burns, um, wound care is the most important initially, and then you'll you'll be uh, you'll see what's what's left behind, and you might need to if it's very deep, place a vacuum device um, or do full thickness skin grafting uh, to get more bulk potentially, or then split thickness skin grafting. But the, the, exactly that, the most important thing is a conservative upfront support the patient, provide wound care let their wound declare itself in those cases so that you know what is non-viable and what can be saved. That can take days to even a couple weeks to fully mature and manifest itself. It was great seeing all of you attend this lecture today. Yeah, thank you all so much for joining and sharing your experience and thoughts as well. Thank you, Dr. Hagedorn and Dr. Skokin for your time. And thank you, Dr. Kigongo, Dr. Kichisa, and Dr. Kira for organizing everything. It was a thank pleasure you. to see everyone.
And I think that we are speaking with you again in a few weeks. Yes, Does that I think sound right December 1st. Challenge